Awesome. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, morning, afternoon, or evening for, for some of you. I'm excited to tell you about some of the approaches we're developing and describing non-equilibrium phenomena, cavity couple phenomena. Before I get started, I want to acknowledge these students and postdocs who've worked with me on some of the work I will present today, as well as fabulous collaborations with people across the country and, and really across the globe. And it happens to be May the 4th, so I figured uh, at least a joke about that needs to be made by someone if it hasn't already. So may the 4th be with you. Okay. All right. So we think about predicting and controlling quantum systems, and we take a fairly broad view, and I'm going to primarily focus in my talk today on ab initio QED and, and how we link that with correlated electronic structure methods, and really what that can tell us about some of the very interesting experiments that have been done now in cavity control of kinetic matter, cavity control of chemistry, and how this intersection is, is just getting started. Frederick's talk earlier today uh, reminded me that we should probably uh, talk about some of the uh, open systems methods as well. So we are developing new techniques to describe non-Markovian dynamics where, where you're thinking about the path and, and the memory associated with the path and, and algorithms there that might be mapped not just onto classical devices, but also onto small quantum devices. So. Um, we have a couple of papers on this, and, and you're welcome to ask me about it during the, the Q&A. Okay, so when I tell people, we think about predicting the behavior of quantum matter, uh, there's this expectation that I have a single acronym to rule them all, and I really don't. In fact, things on the left typically come from a, a quantum chemistry standpoint, where we're thinking about these small confined systems, we're thinking about knowing something about the orbital density, potential energy surface, changes to the potential energy surface. This is gonna be very important today, by the way, when we talk about the cavity mediated uh, reactivity and how we understand it in terms of uh, potential energy surfaces in some cases and cases where that is not um, um, is a sufficient uh, uh, descriptor. There are approaches that, that describe systems here on the, the right of, of the slide here, where we're thinking about changes to the band structure. We're thinking about how the drive changes something about the electron photon coupling, how, how that might influence things. And those are really approaches that come from materials physics, from condensed matter. What we try and do in, in my group is, is really bridge across those in a way that you'd be able to uh, think about new non-equilibrium phenomena in quantum matter. So the word correlations in particular, and I, I know it means various things to, to various people. So let me just briefly tell you what the word correlations uh, means to me and, and how we're gonna be thinking about it, right? So there are various genres of correlations. Uh, the most canonical one, the, the one that maybe first comes to mind is thinking about the electron-electron interaction and, and thinking about really the strongly correlated electron problem. And that is a subset of the types of correlations that become relevant in quantum matter, in particular, when you talk about driving quantum matter. So, Thinking about the electron photon interaction is, is relevant even without a drive, but I would argue that it becomes critical when you're trying to capture excited state behavior. And in fact, treating the electron photon interaction and various nonlinear phononic processes, so various types of three, four, and five phonon processes that are very readily, readily accessible in, in some of the uh, experiments is, is quite important. So we're developing approaches that allow you to go beyond leading order in treating various electron phonon diagrams, and in some cases also the phonon electron interaction. I'm not going to get a chance to talk about that today, but again, uh, and there's a, a little uh, nugget there for, for you to ask me about. So when we think about incorporating these interactions all at once, it's a little overwhelming even though we know that, that as you think about non-equilibrium systems, you should probably have each of these incorporated at some level of theory. So what we do in, in my group is to think about these more from a diagrammatic uh, standpoint where you can decide and, and make uh, some justification as, as rigorously as you want around which level of uh, theory to treat which interaction at and where you maybe want to go beyond a, a say a leading order diagram and where maybe a leading order is sufficient. So all the cases I'm going to tell you about today, um, the electron phonon and the phonon phonon interactions will be quite critical for, for understanding what we're doing, not only uh, for the 
the, the work in in uh, nonlinear phonetics and and how we uh, use that, but also the work in uh, cavity control of uh, chemistry. So just something to keep in mind. We're going to think about it first in in the molecular or the um, finite size context in terms of these vibrational modes. And then as we talk about condensed matter, it will become phonons. OK, so this is uh, these are figures, by the way, courtesy from a, a um, nice RMP that's coming out from uh, Centef, uh, McIver, and others on all the approaches that have been recently developed to explore correlated light matter interactions and, and uh, interactions that are far from equilibrium. And the take home here is that these various techniques, whether they're in the near fields, far fields, uh, span literally and quite metaphorically <laughs> the entire spectral band here. Um, these, these experiments are um, not well described by typical techniques in statistical and, and computational physics that invoke thermodynamic equilibrium. In fact, when we think about these driven systems, you, you really um, ought to not invoke anything that resembles a, a temperature or, or uh, even talk about things that are uh, slightly away from equilibrium. We're talking about things that are quite far away from equilibrium. And um, density functional theory, time-dependent density functional theory can do a reasonable job in some cases. So we know that it's not a faithful description of um, non-trivial correlation effects. And uh, there it becomes important for us to maybe think about uh, either non-equilibrium green function or um, other types of diagrammatic techniques that provide us a, a framework for getting um, various few, few body correlation functions without, again, dealing with the full anybody wave function. Uh, many of you here are, are experts in areas of uh, and DMFT or, or DMRG and, and know the, the, uh, the possibilities there as well as some of the limitations. Uh, so something we're trying to figure out is when we, when we really think about these driven systems, what's a, um, how can we modularly incorporate some of these things? And if we take the other limit, where instead of, we're in, instead of a, a strong drive, where uh, maybe we're talking about correlations with the cavity, what is a good level of theory to treat the matter at while keeping the photon uh, there explicitly? Okay, so this is a theorist view of the world with light on one axis, matter on another, going from analytical to, to very computational uh, approaches. And, and from an analytical standpoint, you can do a lot with models and quantum optics. Though, of course, any correlations that are um, inherent in, in either the material or the molecule there become very, very challenging to, to incorporate into some of those analytical models. Now, we think about conventional electronic structure theories, um, something that's Explicit is that, you know, okay, you can have these optical excitations, so you can talk about quasi particles, in, in particular in, in the case of GW or the base self mirror equation approach. Um, but the photon there is almost always treated classically, even in the case of a couple of cluster singles doubles, which is in some ways the, the gold standard in electronic structure theory, uh, incorporating the, the, um, the quantum optical aspect there is very challenging. So there's been an effort recently to introduce approaches that formally, as well as computationally, and I distinguish those two things because some things are possible formally, but computationally intractable, where you merge QED and electronic structure theory. And this can be done at various levels of um, theory, both on the um, and on how you're treating matter and, and of course uh, the, the QD aspects, right? So you can have QD plus Hartree-Fock and of course all the issues associated with a conventional Hartree-Fock uh, description will then percolate to, to a QD plus Hartree-Fock approach. You do QED plus uh, time-dependent density function theory. That, as I'll show you here in a second, is reasonable to at least capture things like time dynamics with these cavity-mediated uh, reactions. Uh, there is, you can go even a step further, and, and there are papers in, in 2020, 2020 and 2021 uh, where, where uh, we and a couple QED and uh, other higher-level electronic structure theories, including a paper from uh, Henrik Koch, where they have a QED plus couple cluster that gets some interesting changes to uh, the the uh, graphic correlations. Okay, so there's a lot at this intersection. I, I'd say that QD uh, plus DFT is, is maybe up in this right hand of the quadrant. Uh, and, and maybe if I had to put uh, QED plus couple cluster, et cetera, they'd be all the way uh, off this uh, chart here. So we're thinking about how we can use this now uh, or develop these approaches again to answer some of the mysteries in um, cavity control, both of, of materials and, and molecules. Okay, so 
let's go from these uh, from this discussion of methods where current methods can and cannot predict what we are interested in to actually looking at some examples. So I have two examples for you. I'll start with the linear kind of regime where we talk about strong coupling to the cavity and what it does to the molecules. Um, and, and then I'll go into an example where, where we do something similar with, uh, uh, with a connect matter uh, system. Okay, so let's, let's, uh, let's get there. So the uh, QED plus uh, TDDFT aspect, right? Uh, more formally looks as so. Uh, we have a physical system and um, our physical system has electrons, we have nuclei, we have photons. The nuclei here are incredibly important because getting anything that looks like vibrational strong coupling, which was really what was brought up in some of the really provocative experiments from Everson and others. Uh, so having the nuclei there gives us access to that vibrational strong coupling. It also gives us access to finite temperature, which is incredibly important because otherwise everything is uh, essentially in this is zero K regime, which is which is not always uh, physical um, and as we know. And we now need to come up with an effective cone sham system, right? And this is something that people do quite frequently in, in thinking about uh, mappings in, in various electronic structure theories. But this one-to-one -one correspondence really goes from a set of uh, internal variables to a set of external variables. Now, in its original form, QED plus DFT is in a, a fully um, relativistic uh, limit, you, you could do lots of interesting formal things, but computationally, we're going to constrain it to the non-relativistic limit, and we're going to take a, a dipole approximation here. This is going to make some things easier for us. And we're going to go from the uh, internal variables on the left, which are the time-dependent electron density, as well as the mode resolved electric displacement coordinate, to the external variables. So this is that one-to-one -one map, the correspondence that we're coming up with, uh, to the time-dependent external potential and a time-dependent current. This is... Um, the, the key to doing this is to find a meaningful mean field, mean field exchange correlation kernel that allows us to show that map. Now we've been able to do this for, for certain um, simple and, and not so simple molecular systems. And I'll, I'll show you uh, those here in a second. Okay, so um, one quick thing about getting spectra and incorporating excited states here. Yes, TDDFT doesn't get all the non-trivial correlations. Uh, that's the bad side of it. The good side is you can get a bunch of excited states. And in fact, um, I you know say that some of the other methods from electronic structure theory that have been extended to this uh, electron photon case, including, uh, say, the, the Born-Oppenheimer approximation within the cavity, as a cavity Born-Oppenheimer approximation, as it's called, or the, the exact uh, factorization approach for some of these small molecules, each of those have their own um, uh, limitations. So the cavity born oppenheimer approximation is uh, useful in this uh, vibrational strong coupling regime because it allows us to uh, think about, you know, changes to the, the various surfaces and, and essentially how the, uh, the cavity is changing the, the uh, nuclear displacements. We have two uh, options here. We have two possibilities. So we can either be in the time domain, we can explicitly propagate in time, or we can do things in the frequency domain, uh, which is frequently called the, the Casita equation approach. And we'll be interested in the various response functions associated with it. Um, now for our response functions, right? So we're going to want something that uh, gives us a, a good, so, so we have that big mean field exchange correlation kernel, and we're not going to try and tackle the whole thing explicitly. We're going to actually break it up into two parts uh, corresponding to the, the two um, decimal equations here written for the response functions. Uh, and the kernels that we're going to look at are one that corresponds to electron-electron interaction, and the other part that incorporates all the effects associated with electron-photon interaction. Now, for the case of the Hartree exchange correlation functional, right, so if we were within that, that um, Hartree fac or even a, a slightly more sophisticated quantum chemistry uh, description, we can, um, we want to keep not only the, the equilibrium position of our, um, of, of, our, of our system, but also the extended nuclear uh, configurations. And this is going to be important because I'm going to show you here in a second that the enharmonic um, uh, interactions there are actually pretty important to getting this uh, cavity control uh, um, of, of chemistry actually right, okay? So the other thing here is that in the excited state manifold of even the simplest of molecules, you can take a formalde formaldehyde or a benzene molecule, um, we, we need to calculate states that are mixture of Rydberg states as well as some of the more localized uh, valence states with, with pi, pi star uh, transition. So we can do that both in the frequency domain approach as well as uh, in, in some cases in the, the uh, time propagator approach. This has some nice intersections with previous work by uh, Shal Mukamel. I encourage you to take a look at one of his papers, particularly on manipulating non-adiabatic dynamics that avoided, avoided crossings. 
Okay, so I've been alluding to this uh, experiment from um, Emerson, and, and this has baffled the community for some time. This is, by the way, the first time I'm giving a talk on this particular result. It was just uh, put in the archive last week, and, and I'm excited for uh, everyone's <laughs> input on this. Okay, so there's a conundrum. This is a very complicated uh, uh, chemical reaction. I'm not a card carrying chemist, uh, but this is a reaction where the resonant uh, vibrational strong coupling was inhibiting this, this chemical reaction. Okay, and the, the mechanism is here on, on the top right. And a couple of things were different between what the experiment is observed as well as what previous theoretical work was seeing. And the most important one being that the impact of the cavity and the resonant condition, which was consistently observed experimentally, was, was not being seen uh, from a, a theory standpoint. And we think that we have uh, resolved this by using the, the approach I just showed you with this uh, QD plus TDFT. Uh, and we've recovered the resonant dynamic nature of the, the chemical inhibition under vibrational strong coupling. Now, let me just uh, walk you through uh, what's going on here. Uh, so the mechanism is, is the, the uh, uh, top right. And what we are interested in is following the, the various trajectories for this uh, reaction to occur. What we expect to see is that at some point, uh, either something is trying to attach or detach and it, it uh, is inhibited somehow, right? And that could be because of a, a change in the uh, nuclear configurations or because the energy is delocalized across um, various, various uh, bonds. I'm, I'm, I'm leading the witness here a little bit, but, but that's uh, something that we're gonna uh, um, conclude here. So we look at the um, vibrational absorption spectrum along the, the cavity polarization direction. And uh, we find that, of course, there is a strong coupling as the uh, vibrational eigenmode at 856 inverse uh, centimeters. Um, and we, we look at what happens if you have just the isolated complex versus the case where um, you might have uh, the, the hybridization, right? So that, that would be, and everything should be ideally normalized to the case where there's no cavity and a case where there is cavity. And we do time-dependent uh, calculations here to describe uh, the non-adiabatic movement of electrons, nuclei, and cavity during the reaction. So we basically track the entire reaction and, and, and uh, look at uh, various trajectories, right? So what we find is that the cavity introduces actually an additional coupling between the various uh, vibrational, uh, the molecular vibrational modes, and this gives um, new and harmonic vibrations. And that's really the reason for uh, why there's an inhibition here. And, and also the fact that we needed to have the nuclei and then time propagate explicitly. So the reason why previous theoretical approaches, as, as nice as uh, they are in capturing some other um, cases, we're not able to capture this particular uh, experiment. Um, it's not cited here, but this experiment and, and the corresponding paper appeared in, in Science last year. So um, basically because of the, this new basis of eigenmodes, with, which are these mixed cavity vibrational modes, actually the original vibrational modes of the system become very, very, uh, become increasingly correlated and they get to a, a point where there is a, a new pathway for the energy to be redistributed. And that's the, the cause of, of what's going on here. And um, there are a couple of things that, that were very uh, lucky in, in, this, um, in this experiment uh, such that uh, so, so essentially the fact that you have this uh, set of vibrations along the uh, fluoride, silicon, carbon, carbon chain, and, and the, the geometry of that chain that allows for this redistribution. Um, but these um, many anharmonic modes, and I keep emphasizing that these vibrational modes actually contribute to the reaction. And they actually, um, this is also the reason why if you had a reduced um, uh, a subset of the nuclear coordinates and not some of these extended configurations actually you wouldn't be able to uh, describe what's going on. Now, um, so, so what we're looking at here is um, essentially the, the time result influence of the mode occupations by the resonant vibrational uh, uh, strong coupling. And what we're looking at uh, explicitly is everything normalized to the case of there being a bare uh, PTAF system, essentially something without the cavity. And so we do this for various um, various trajectories. And, and um, I had some videos on this, but I don't think they, they show up pretty well on, on Zoom. Um, but we, we, what we find is that there is a clear dependence on, um, of course, the symmetry of the molecule associated reaction pathways, as well as the fact that you get this, um, because of these new and harmonic modes, a redistribution of the vibrational energy. And that's um, essentially the, the reason for the, the cavity mediated um, 
changes in chemical reactivity here. So, so we think that this approach is going to tell us a lot more about the various mysteries in cavity control of um, electrode systems. And, and I encourage all of you to uh, look at, um, at the, the, the archive link here. Let me switch gears for, for the next couple of minutes and tell you about uh, a different way of thinking about it that doesn't invoke this um, exchange correlation kernel. And, and you could argue that coming up with a set of exchange correlation kernels here is, is um, going to be challenging and, and um, it's you know, going to be limited by all the things that, that, it, that approaches in conventional electronic structure theory. So a different way to think about it is in these in the case of these photonic quasi-particles. So I have the system on the left where I have uh, basically a bunch of, this is exact system, many, many uh, virtual excitations of our uh, bare atom and, and cavity uh, system. And I'm gonna approximate it with a few virtual excitation. And I can do this because um, essentially it's what's needed to, to come up with our uh, ansatz here is the notion that there is an effective photonic vacuum whose modes are going to be different than the modes in the absence of light matter coupling. And so we do that. In fact, we look, this is an approach completely separate from the QD plus electronic structure, but this also gives us a different set of observables. And in this case, in, in real space, uh, where we are actually able to also show that certain other simple perturbative approaches in regimes of deep strong coupling would, would strongly deviate from both uh, predictions from our method as well as from uh, exact diagonalization. So what I'm showing here is a case with exact diagonalization on um, uh, 50 photon modes, very few um, excitations, and we're considering a simplified system here because we wanted to be able to do this exactly. Um, we have our method in blue, and how it relates to variational principle is something that's spelled out in, in some detail in, in the paper on it. Uh, but we go from re essentially regimes of no coupling to a regime that you could perhaps only re um, realize in, in superconducting cavities. And usually techniques are, are limited to a, a subset of this uh, coupling range. Uh, we are not limited by that. And uh, we, we contrast it with um, a simple perturbative approach, which you find works pretty well in regimes of, of, of some coupling. This is a regime where you'd expect a dielectric cavity or uh, a plasmatic cavity to be without heroic attempts to get to strong coupling. So as soon as you get to regimes of, of strong coupling, uh, what you find is that uh, perturbative approaches don't do well. In fact, this is what I would lovingly call a major discrepancy, especially when you get into those regimes of uh, deep strong coupling. So we're exploring how exactly to take this method now and apply it to some of the, the problems in um, strong coupling, both to molecules and to materials. There are uh, some interesting results that, that show that perhaps you could control uh, the condensate via, via uh, coupling to the, the cavity and, and do some uh, interesting physics there. And we're trying to see how this method, especially since it is real space, can capture uh, those observables. So in the next couple of minutes, let me switch gears from vibrational modes to talking about something that is um, maybe a little more familiar, which is uh, we're going to go talk about photon polaritons, which is essentially uh, those, those same uh, uh, types of, of uh, vibrational couplings, but in uh, low dimensional systems. And uh, the advantage of thinking about photon polaritons in, in particular, by the way, polaritons come in various flavors. Um, they, they're excitons, magnons, plasmons, uh, combinations thereof, Cooper pair polaritons. There's, there's a giant panorama of these. There have been quite a few reviews written about them. A uh, reason we're thinking about but I'll one moment. Uh, there is one question that is probably relevant to the previous experiment before you, before you go too far, and we should wrap up fairly soon. So the question is, uh, in that experiment that you showed, uh, what is the temperature and are the calculations that you use to model the experiment at finite temperature or zero T? Yes. So these are actually, we're sampling out of um, um, the trajectories taken at uh, 300K. And actually that's that the experiment is also a, a room temperature experiment. Uh, they in the um, in, in some of their data show a temperature dependence, and and we think that that we um, with our method are actually also going to be able to capture that. Yeah, but that's an excellent question. So you're you're essentially asking, um, you know, in in order to so when I pick out these trajectories, we we have a set of about thirty trajectories here, which are all launched with initial conditions that are sampled from a, a thermal distribution at, at three hundred Kelvin. Um, and if if we were doing this at, at zero K, then some of those would you know, that all of those things would fall out <laughs> and things would be quite unphysical. Yeah. Um, 
hopefully that that answers a uh, question. That was a really good point, and, and sorry for not having explicitly mentioned it. Okay, so so we're thinking about phonoplaritons and uh, phonoplaritons in particular in uh, truly two D materials, especially cases where. Uh, well, in true 2D materials, you'd say that there isn't an LOTO split at the gamma point. Uh, so how do I have a phonoplaraton? And um, the, the, so we, we come up with a formalism that essentially allows you to think about this in terms of the conductivity in, in terms of uh, the, the 2D phonon dispersion, which you can get from your favorite ab initio calculation or from your uh, favorite experimentalist and, and know something about the damping. And this expression is general. So we applied this to HBN nearly there um, and, and saw things that, that I think are, are quite, um, quite reliable, including the fact that the monolayer is fundam fundamentally different from two or three layers. And this is something that's also now um, shown to be the, the case if you have, uh, say, a, a twist introduced and, and you have some uh, stuff going on there. So emboldened by this, um, we predicted phonoplaritons in other 2D materials that are yet some that have been synthesized, though phonoplaritons there haven't been observed and some that, that are yet to be synthesized. And I'll just leave you with uh, that as, as my last slide here, that in fact, um, ABO3 oxides in particular, uh, STO and more recently, titanate and lithium niobate um, can, can, so STO has been synthesized as a monolayer by uh, Harold Wong's group in, in 2019. Uh, we think that if you can make monolayer perovskites of these health materials, you're gonna be uh, actually looking at, at doing everything that involves phonoplaritons and uh, regimes of ultra strong coupling to phonoplaritons, but you can move that to different parts of the terahertz using these uh, proskites. So with that, um, I'll stop and uh, happy to take any other questions.